Um, my name is David Bowler. I'm a, I, I, I wear various hats in the Natural Society of Natural Science, and our particular reason for doing this tour uh, this afternoon is that this year is the 75th anniversary of the formation of the Archaeological and Historical Section in the Natural Society of Natural Science. And so this seemed like a good way of, of uh, reminding ourselves of our continuing existence. So we've, I've picked the theme of Perthshire's Lost Landmarks, which means that what I'm going to be trying to do is to take you to places where interesting things and important things stood and, and, and aren't visible anymore, but you can sort of work out where they were if you look closely and if you know a bit about the map of the city of Perth. As I go along, I shall be referring from time to time to two rather interesting plans, which I'm sure many of you know. This one is Rutherford 1774, and is one of the, um, I think probably the earliest properly surveyed plan of Perth. A Pettit 1715 is more of a sketch. Um, slight confusion because, uh, for practical reasons, he's put the river at the bottom, so north is that way rather than at the top. But, it's, but you, you get used to that after a while. And I'll be referring to that from time to time. Um, Mike here also has a copy of it, so if you can't see mine, you can look over Mike's shoulder. And on the other side, we have this um, reconstruction drawing commissioned by the Heritage Trust some years ago, which shows the Perth on the eve of the Reformation. Um, hence the fires coming up from the, the monasteries. But it's quite a, quite a good view of, of what Perth might have looked like in the, uh, in the 1500s. We shall be walking around in a kind of a circle, but we'll more or less come back to here, or almost come back to here. Um, in theory it will take about an hour, in practice it will take longer unless you stop me talking. But we'll see how we go. Let's begin by pointing out where we are right now, which is, let me get this right, from Rutherford, we are about here. Um, where George Street meets what will later become Mill Street. And this uh, suburb here, which no longer exists, is roughly where the Museum and Art Gallery building was constructed, the stages. And so we'll gather around here after the noise of the bus, and I'll say a wee bit more. Standing in this area here, and that area, that suburb there, is partly subsumed under the 1930s museum buildings and partly under the concert hall behind us, which is where, there or somewhere quite near it, is where there was a castle in Perth until the flood of 1209-1210. So that's perhaps the first and biggest of our landmarks. The castle was an add-on to the borough of Perth, and I suspect that everybody except the king knew that it was extremely vulnerable to flooding <laughs> and in a low-lying area. <laughs> so that's how he was able to acquire it. Um, and then after the castle becomes destroyed by the flood, um, he then vacates the whole area and gifts it to the Blackfriars, the Dominicans. And so all that area to the north of the borough becomes Blackfriars land. And we'll say a wee bit more about that later. Um, on Rutherford it says Blackfriars lands here, but it's a huge area that's gifted to the Dominican Friary. Um, we are just, as you'll see in a moment, at the top end of Skinnergate, which most people think is an insertion into the town plan to connect to the castle. The little mound that we've just come down off is, of course, um, an 18th century construction. It's just a ramp to get onto Smeaton's Bridge, which is 1770s. Um, and so, so all this is made ground that we're standing on. We did an extensive excavation under the concert hall um, and found remains of the suburb, possibly remains of the castle, um, a ditch with a, a stone bridge over. We actually preserved the bits of the stone bridge as a sort of construction kit and it was last heard of in a, in a council depot somewhere but I'm not quite sure what happened after that. One of the most interesting things that we found on that site, um, which I think is still in the uh, the collections of, the, of, what will be, of what was Perth Museum and Art Gallery and will become Perth Museum in the, in the new city halls. Here's a skeleton that was found folded up in a rubbish pit with a crack across the top of its head. 
uh, and some money in his pocket um, and one hand on the edge of the pit which suggests that it met a somewhat um, uh, uh, unexpected end. This was a very rough area, this part of Perth. Even up to the 1930s, it, when I first came to Perth about 40 years ago, speaking to some of the older residents, they said that when they were little, you would never go in this area by yourself at night. It was well dodgy. The, um, the tanners' yards were over there, and of course, the uh, tanneries were very, very unpleasant processes. Um, involving an interesting solution of um, dog's dirt, urine and other substances. Um, and so uh, this was a rough area and it, it, it was not surprising that there, might, there was a murder in the uh, um, in Middle Ages and, and probably many more since. Um, we think that with a bit of ingenuity we could probably work out which exactly of the seats in the concert hall corresponds exactly to the position of the skeleton. And we've always thought it would be rather, it's, it's towards the front, I think it's in the third row, and a few seats over, um, that it would be rather nice to have a sort of special embroidered cover for that seat that will charge extra. But they are sitting exactly where the skeleton was found. Would it be in the stalls or not? Yes, it is. Oh, yes. Well, that's all right then. <laughs> but so far, no one has has sort of really wanted to take this idea further. But I think it's, it's one of those ideas that, that that definitely deserves to be thought about. Let's move on. So this is the red brig, and if you look on the map, you will see if I get this the right way around, uh, it is the point where the Skinner Gate there crosses Perth Lane which is running under the, under the Premier Inn, under, under what was Pullers and is now the Queen's Offices, under my feet and through here. So the Red Brig is right behind me um, and that was where the old road went out of Perth to the north and up to Murton. Mm -hmm. um, Skinner Gate, as I say, was an, we think is an insertion into the street plan. And as the name implies, was the street where the Skinners, the Glovers were concentrated. Um, the, the, the Skinners' yards were in the area over there, behind uh, the concert hall, uh, where, where the tan pits were, so on. and there were various uh, leather working crafts along this street here. We've just finished writing a monograph on, well, no, not a monograph, it's going to be a special edition of, of Tafaj, Tayside and Five Archaeological Journal, published online on all the excavations that we've done in Skinnergate over the last few decades. Very interesting and going right up into the 19th and early 20th centuries. All sorts of interesting characters. We found a bone whistle um, in the, uh, um, the, the uh, material under Gillis. Um, it happens, that's where the bellman lived. The, the, in Skinnergate, the town's bellman, the town's crier, lived in Skinnergate. And there was a, a custom every day that um, there was a procession um, around the town at five o'clock in the morning to wake everybody up with a drummer and a whistle player and I think we might have found the whistle broken for obvious reasons <laughs> uh, as in ooh I think we've had enough of that um, and then it would then go around in, in the, about like, six o'clock in the evening something like that seven or seven or seven in the evening to tell everybody it was bedtime time to put the fire out curfew um, so there'll be a procession going around the town twice a day. Uh, we might, well, I'd like to believe we found one of the instruments used uh, for that purpose in Skinnergate. The town walls, in terms of lost landmarks, the town walls ran inside the line of the lake. So the lake formed like the wet ditch with the town wall on the inside of it. And so we can now go into this area here and I'll say a wee bit more. So as you can see, the sign behind me says that it's a portion of the old city wall. And it sort of is. Um, I wouldn't like to say that this is the very wall upon which Robert the Bruce leaned his ladder during the siege of Perth. Though it might have been. It is quite old masonry with this green sandstone. And there would have been this, this would have run all the way along um, beside the lade. The lade is just outside it. Where all those uh, heritage wheelie bins are uh, at the corner there, <laughs> we did an excavation about two metres deep and found the foundations of a much bigger, thicker wall below this that might be the original defensive wall, and also where the other heritage wheelie bins are, right up against the floodgates. We did an excavation there and found what seemed like the timber underpinnings of the original red brick, where it springs off the structure and goes across the, the lade. 
everything that you build in Perth either has to be capable of floating or be underpinned somehow. I, will, I always explain to people that medieval Perth is rather like a cow pat. It's about two meters or two and a half meters of um, decayed organic material, the contents of cesspits, um, the, the contents of wells and so on, and then a crust of, of 18th and 19th century masonry above that. And any heavy structure goes through the crust and on down. And as you'll see, a, a lot of the older buildings are doing precisely that. And when I say that it's sort of like a cow pap, the actual material is to a large extent the same. Because the earliest buildings in Perth, including the ones we excavated under Gillies, were a daub and wattle construction, where you have a, a line of stakes driven into the ground, basketwork woven between, and then you cover the whole thing with daub, which is a, a mixture of, of clay and hair and cow dung and other things. Cow dung is a great material. When it dries, it gives a sort of leathery texture, which semi-waterproofs the structure and makes it more sort of enduring. But um, it, it's kind of gone out of fashion in later years. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might come back. You never know, as, as the new organic material. Um, but so we found a lot of that. And that's really why Perth is the way it is. The, the, that kind of material, it preserves wood and leather and bone. It preserved our bone fluke that we found in Skinner Gate. It preserves the foundations of timber buildings and so on. But it's all rather squishy and mobile and rather smelly. Um, and there's nothing solid. If you want to find the solid geology of Paraf, uh, it's 77.5 meters down. Everything mm -hmm. under that is clay and gravel and sand, and layer after layer after layer, and then two and a half meters of archaeology on top of that, and then a crust, and, which is what we're standing on. Um, You'll notice the ground is rising because it's rising up to George Street, which is an 18th century insertion to go onto the bridge. Those of you who were here in the floods of the 1990s will know that roughly to my ankles is the height of floodwaters um, in the 1990s, um, which is why we've come through all those bronze um, flood protection doors there. We can carry on a bit. Come onto George Street, which as you can see in Ron Rutherford is a, an 18th century insertion into the street plan. And with these rather brown 18th and 19th century facades, which are quite high and quite level, um, you know, Perth is coming up in the world with the new bridge and beginning to have more sort of ambition architecture. When you get to the high street, you'll notice that the buildings that are closer up to the high street and are much, much older are all at different angles, are all sinking. And that is, of course, because they have uh, penetrated the crust of the compact and down they are going. <laughs> It's quite visible what they're doing and how, how mobile they are. If you walk along the high street, a lot of the, the high street facades are in audio. And if you go around the backs of the same properties and look at, look at what the building is doing behind, you will see that everything is on the move because it's all resting on these rather soft deposits. Uh, so we're following the course of the Laid, which is it's not, it's not so much a lost landmark as a hidden landmark. It's still there. It's flowing under our feet just following it out to the tank. Here we are, um, standing on the banks of the Tay. Tay Street, of course, doesn't exist on this map because it, it's an 1870s addition uh, to the town plan. It, it's a, a Victorian embankment. I'll say a wee bit more about that in a minute. Um, this area here, roughly under that yellow marquee over there, seems to be about the site of what's shown as the Deadlands on some early maps, and possibly a small cemetery, otherwise undocumented. We don't know much about it, but if ever they start digging holes in that area, who knows what will come to light. Um, the building behind you, of course, is the old uh, middle church. And one of the things that you notice, if you look at the 19th and early 20th century ordnance survey, you'll see that Perth has a church every street corner and it has a public house every seven doors. And that's, it was incredibly densely populated, that, that all the population of the town was contained in the area of the town defences, all squeezed in. And it's not really until after the Second World War that you get a massive expansion out into the suburbs. So you have, the, you have all these people crammed into tenement houses, um, small flats, uh, you know, or, or stacked up one above the other, especially in Skinnergate. We've been doing some research, all the different people in Skinnergate um, and their different professions and so on, and, and how cramped together they are. And so you, 
there is the population to support a large number of public houses, some on a grand scale like the Royal George, and some on the scale of what would be more or less a Shabin, and quite a few of those. Um, and with the churches, lots and lots of different churches of different, different shapes and sizes, partly because of the sheer number of, of people living in the town centre, and partly because of the tendency of, of um, the Church of Scotland in the uh, post-Reformation period to fragment. A, you've probably seen the wonderful diagram of all the different branches. That, it's like a rabbit's family tree, as, as they all fall out with each other. Um, David, what would have been the population at that time? I think it's getting, on rather for 74, from memory, I think you might be looking at the order of maybe 10, 20,000, something like that. The medieval population of the town centre is about three to 4,000, we think, which is roughly what it is today. Whereas the, 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 the as it were, the overall population of the town today is about 45,000 or more, but all spread out. But so, and then by the time you get to the 1930s, before the great sort of spreading out begins, you might have a the order of 30,000 people packed into the town centre. It, it, it was reckoned to be one of the most crowded places in Britain, with, with a number of people squeezed into a small space. So that's now flats. So amongst those, our, our lost or changing that much, there's a surprising number of churches that you keep your eyes open and spot them of all different shapes and sizes. And I'll say a, a bit more about some of those as we continue on our travels. Last thing to mention is what we're standing on. Um, what we are standing on is um, about five centimetres of this of thick synthetic stone and then a bed of sand and then about 20 centimetres of reinforced concrete and then about two metres of polystyrene foam. Um, this is this is how the flood defense... Sorry, David, I didn't put that. About two metres of polystyrene foam. But when did they put the foam the After the 1990s floods, no what they did was yet. that they dug out behind the Victorian uh, riverfront wall without demolishing it, put in a line of piles, dropped in these big polystyrene blocks with holes in them to fit over the piles, and then put the concrete on top, and it, it comes out to the edge and turns up. So behind this stonework here is actually a concrete lip. Um, so the whole thing is self-supporting, sitting on these blocks of polystyrene, which are just there to keep the water out. And then the whole thing is, is to keep the flood, le flood level out. If you were here during the floods in the 1990s, you'll know that the floods came more or less up to, I suppose, about waist height, where I am now, or a bit below. Um, so the, you know, these things are here for a reason, uh, the, these flood defences. And amongst our lost monuments, or lost features, you might remember the line of mature lime trees that grew where these slightly diminutive potted shrubs are now, um, <laughs> which are, are fitted in amongst the, uh, the polystyrene blocks. They will get bigger, but they'll never get to the size of the, of the mature lime trees that we need to grow. There are some limes amongst the trees here, I think, but on a fairly small scale, on not the, the grand things that they grow. And not, of course, the, the raw type rain, which is several of to buy that shop. But uh, generally, they've been replaced by this solid concrete wall to keep the water out. And the rain is out for, falls out just below the, um, the bridge. If you go and stand the other side of the river, or if you stand on Smeaton's Bridge and lean over about falling in, you will see the archway, you will see the lathe coming out at that point there. So it's definitely there, it's still functioning, but uh, well hidden. Okay, um, here we are. We are, we're standing about here. We're standing out in the river, basically. And when Perth had a bridge, this um, heritage is ever crossing. Very nice to commemorate the position of the, uh, the medieval bridge just upstream from the end of Perth Harbour, or, or, or from the end of the high street of the harbour, which I'll speak about in a moment. So you have a low bridge, probably a, on wooden uh, piers, or possibly a bit like the bridges that you have in here, um, for example. You know, medieval bridge, piers close together, arches quite low, and so on. This bridge was destroyed in a flood, um, and then and was replaced in, I think, 1621 or thereby by a nice new stone arch bridge designed by the, the master mason Milne, um, which was washed away the following year in the flood. <laughs> um, because the Tay is a difficult river to bridge, it's difficult to deal with. Um, those of you who remember the, the, the floods of the 1990s will know what I'm talking about. 
I've seen the Thames in flood before the barrage was built. And the Thames will flood at high tide and it's that water. That's not how the Tay floods. The Tay floods at any stage of the tide. It floods when the, the snow in the mountains melts. And so it's not slack water, it's white water at 15 knots coming straight down um, from, from the hills. From the, uh, and then from uh, Strathmore through the island. And if the timing of the melting between uh, the highlands and Strathmore is just right, you get a massive surge of water come straight through and sweeps all before it. And that's what, that's what happened in the 1990s twice. It's what happened to this bridge here. It almost happened to Smeaton's bridge there, um, the 1770s bridge, which was built after a hundred years ago. But Smeaton's bridge is so indestructible, it just stood. All the melting ice blocked up behind it before the dam. And then the ice went round the north edge and right round the town. The, 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 river, the, the river just diverted straight round. And practically destroyed the northern suburb of town. So, so it was the bridge survived, almost nothing else did. Uh, but it's a very strong construction in Sweden. As befits a man who was better known as a lighthouse engineer and was used to, to building indestructible engineering. Um, which is why we still have it today. At very low water, in some conditions, in drought conditions in the summer, if you look into the river, you will see a line of turbulence across the river behind it, which is the piers of um, Milnes Bridge and earlier bridges on the southern side, uh, disturbing the water. So, in other conditions, you can still see this bridge, but the um, uh, but then there was a long gap, so they put that one. In. Behind me on the other side of the river, of course, is Peachy Church. And many of you will know the wonderful stained glass window that was designed by Miller, the uh, parables of Jesus. And you'll know also that that's not the original site of Canoe Church. The original site of Canoe Church is a bit farther down the. Whoops! Oh, no, that's never. Yeah, it was a bit farther down the street um, where you, is where the Canoe Isle is now where all the um, rather wonderful gravestones are of the ferrymen. Because for a hundred years we had no bridge, and so we relied on ferry. Um, basically, uh, a punt, or uh, men with punts, um, punting across uh, the river on the demand. So um, that's, another, that's another of the little things we've lost, the, the idea of having a boat service or a ferry service for a parish. That may come back, but it hasn't done as yet. We'll move a little bit farther downstream and I'll stop again. So here we are at the end of the high street and across the end of the high street was the toll booth, which was at the town hall. The foundations are still there underground and when we've seen the drains and water services have been put through, roughly where the bus shelter is, there are still the foundations of the toll booth under the pavement, crossing the end of the high street. And then beyond that is a basin, a uh, harbour basin, into which boats were drawn and unload. Um, and if you remember the floods in the 1990s, you remember all this area was underwater, and more or less up to that bus shelter. So it's the, the, the flood line, in effect, still preserves a reminder of the, of the actual uh, waterfront, as you see laid out here. That was the council offices. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that it's rather on the move. Um, back in the 1980s, a lot of work was done in the basement to try and underpin the foundations. And my, my then colleague, Russell Coleman, who some of us uh, know very well, spent many a happy hour in the basement there recording all the depth of archaeology on which that building sits, somewhat uneasily, which is why you see it so much on the move and so far from vertical or horizontal in most details, which is probably why the council are sort of thinking what other use they can put it to. Let's move on. The reason I've stopped here is because this is showing really what we lost when we gained Tay Street. But until Tay Street was put in, all the properties were sloping down from Watergate, which you can see just in that little panel there. Uh, and so that everything sloped down to, to water level rather than when it does on the other side of the river. If anyone's been to Strongness, um, that's a very nice in, in, in Orkney. 
that's a very good example of what the Paris waterfront would have looked like. With all the properties, Watergate would have been a main street rather than a back street as it is now. And all the properties would have been sloping down from the back of Watergate straight down onto the shore. And in the beginning, there wouldn't have been a harbour as such. Smallish boats would have come in and just pulled up on the shore and unloaded on the shore um, rather the way they might have done in Stromness in Viking times. Um, the Vikings did come here occasionally and, and it was that sort of, that's really the, the, the origins of Perth growing up along the river frontage um, as a, a shore town with a crossing and then the high street and, uh, developing and the church developing behind it all. So Watergate was a much more important street um, in, in early Perth than it is today. Um, and very much overshadowed once the 1870s uh, Tay Street is inserted here. Another of our lost landmarks, of course, is the, the Victorian Bridge, which was a, a, a steel and iron structure where the, the Queen's Bridge now is. And I think some of, before my time, but some of you might remember um, how they jacked up the old Victorian Bridge so as to maintain the crossing and constructed the present concrete bridge under it and then took the Victorian Bridge away. So it was quite a complicated piece of engineering. But that transformed the character of South Street, that South Street used to terminate in the, um, what was the, um, the palace of the Arrows of Gowrie, um, and which later became a barracks. You can see it shown here on this plan, um, and it's shown on Rutherford 1774 as well. Yes, there. So that area there, at the end of South Street and where the county court is, the sheriff, where the sheriff court is, all that was the, the palace of the of the Earls of Gowrie until they were forfeited and then became military barracks after that. Um, and that really it, it is partly reflected in the character of South Street. Even today, South Street is it's the poor relation of High Street. The shops are smaller, um, even more of them are closed or for sale, um, and it's lower down, it floods more easily. During the 1990s floods, much more of South Street flooded than High Street. It was very much a subordinate street, possibly dating back to the time of William the Lion, whereas Perth itself is, is, is a bit earlier than that. Um, so it's one of the areas into which Perth expands, but very much subordinate to the High Street. And very subordinate when it was a road to nowhere before the bridges were built to enable it to cross over to the other side of the same. So we've lost the gardens and the palace, that's all gone, but you can more or less trace it on the outline of the, um, the, the court and the car park behind it and the jail and all the other ancillary facilities at the back of the court. We'll make our way down and when we can we'll cross over the road at South Street when traffic allows, and we'll kind of gather um, down here at the end of Canal Street, uh, but still standing on this um, on, our, on our polystyrene foam platform. So, we are standing more or less on board this ship here, out here in the Tay, looking back. There's the Franciscan Friary, where the Great Friars Burial Ground is now, behind those buildings. The Earl of Gowrie's Palace is this area here, including all of the, the Sheriff Court. Where those trees are growing, that is where the Monk's Tower uh, is on this corner here, now gone, and I'll say more about that in a minute. That formed the corner of the town's defences with the Spey Tower up there. Um, and the, the southern branch of the Lade comes down Medlin Street, round Canal Crescent, down Canal Street, and opens out into this harbour basin here, which is underneath uh, Quayside Court, the sheltered housing there. Um, so we have lost what was called the New Haven by the Grey Fires, which was built just, well, I have to date for it, I think. I might have. Uh, let me see. No, no, I don't. But just before the Reformation, anyway, in 1400s, I think the New Haven by the Great Friars was built. 
and you can see it on Rutherford 70 and 74 here. It changes a bit, the basin gets reduced a bit by a new quay being built uh, to give more working surface for the unloading of boats in this area here with the Greyfriars uh, burial ground in behind and this basin here. Um, the, up until 1984, where Keyside Court now is, uh, dated 1989, very helpfully on the side there, was a building that began life as Path Opera House in the 1880s, sponsored by the Puller family. The, the Pullers were provosts and did all sorts of things in Path. Uh, it, the Opera House wasn't a great success, and so Robert Puller, who was a member of the Baptist Church, arranged for the Baptists to take over the former opera house and use that as their meeting place, which they did right up until the summer of 1984. And then one evening, one Sunday evening, uh, in 1984, the building caught fire and burnt down. I myself was up on Kinul Hill with a party of friends from another church. I think Mike might have actually been there. So there are living witnesses who can confirm that I wasn't here when the fire started. <laughs> <laughs> However, within half an hour, I was down here with a clipboard planning the excavation, <laughs> standing here watching the building burn and working out where we might want to dig. Um, but uh, so it was demolished. It, the interesting thing is because it was the best thing that ever happened to the Baptist church was when it burnt down. They moved out to the western edge to a new purpose-built building and they had to enlarge it within a, f a few years because it wasn't big enough for the congregation. Whereas here, when they met here, it was a big, drafty, unheatable building that was falling down around them. No one could get in here easily on a Sunday evening, and the congregation was dying on its feet. And so, wonderfully, the building caught fire, and that was just the thing they needed. So, but, I, but it wasn't me, okay? <laughs> it wasn't me. Um, so we excavated here and we found the quayside, uh, the surface, made of, of cobbles, genuine cobbles, like rounded boulders set on end, really solid. You could drive a 20-ton a, a excavator over the top of them and they wouldn't move. The remains of the mooring posts, all sorts of things. Most impressive, uh, all under what's now Quayside Court. What we will do um, is cross over and go past the building and gather at the front of Greyfriars Burial Ground and I shall say a little bit more there. We are now standing where this crowd of rioters are standing outside the Grey Friars um, at the time of the Reformation. The Grey Friars burial ground behind us is the site of the Franciscan Friary. Um, dissolved at the Reformation and then in the uh, 1580s gifted to the, the borough to become the, the new uh, public burial ground because the, the burial ground around St John's Kirk was full up. Um, which you can see today, if you go into St John's Kirk, you'll notice that you go down steps to go into the church. That's because the ground has risen all, all around the church because so much of the congregation is under the pavement. <laughs> Um, and we've often carried out excavations there in connection with repaving the works, in connection with the, the refurbishing of the city halls and so on. And yes, they really are. Where the minister used to park his car, back when David Oxton was minister, he used to park his car. The place where he used to park his car, there were burials six inches under the paving slabs. Um, so, you know, you lift a slab, oh, hello. <laughs> um, so that was full. And so this became the public burial ground, and remains so, uh, with some other burial grounds around the town, until the 19th century when uh, Jean Field Road, Wells Hill, uh, becomes the public burial ground. The, the Reformation, of course, results in the dis dissolution of the, the Grey Friars. But in a generation bef leading up to the Reformation, this area, of course, is the scene of, quite, of a thing that is sort of not mentioned very much, but it happened and that's the so-called Spaygate Martyrs. That road there is called Spaygate. You have the Monk's Tower there and the Spay Tower there, and there's the record of um, some, some men who had uh, uh, um, desecrated a <coughs> statue of St. Francis and caused various other disturbances being hanged um, 
under the orders of Cardinal Beaton, who watched from the tower over there, and Helen Stark, who was also involved, who was the wife of one of the men, being drowned in a pool of water, almost certainly right there, almost certainly the, the harbour basin here. So that, that's, that's quite a dark episode in Paris history. What's interesting is to compare and contrast that with the Friars Pot incident, just a decade or so earlier, where a, cra a crowd of, of, of disrespectful townspeople broke into the Black Friars up on the north side of, of, of the borough, up ooh, there, stole the Friars' cooking pot with their lunch and paraded it through the streets. And nothing happened. There's been a change. There was a long tradition, you know, a long medieval tradition of disrespect up to a point towards the church, which was sort of tolerated because you just had to put up with these. But as you move into the period just before the Reformation, it's all getting much more serious. And under Cardinal Beaton, there's much more of a crackdown. But then, um, with John Knox, uh, the reformers win. But it's just interesting to see that transition from the kind of nonsense that you see in Chaucer, the, 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 the sort of the good-natured fun, where um, the, 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 the laity tease the clergy and mock them and give them a hard time, and, and the clergy mock each other, and everyone kind of puts up with it. The transition to something much more serious, where people are being hanged, um, that's an interesting transformation that's happening as everything becomes a lot more fragile in the years leading up to the Reformation. Uh, so here we are with another of our missing monuments, a rather nice painting which is in the uh, McManus galleries in Dundee, and which we now know was by David Octavius Hill, an native of Paris, um, showing this area about 1800 with these um, collier bricks pulled up on shore over there, roughly where the courthouse is now. That there is the monk's tower, roughly over there, under the, uh, where the trees were. This man sitting in his skiff, probably fishing, is sitting just about there under that white car, um, waiting for the tide to come in so that he can collect bags of coal and take them up the canal and deliver them round the backs of the houses. Now that we know it's David Octavius Hill, we know that this is not actually painted from life because he was a, a child at the beginning of, uh, I think, it's, is it 1802 his date? 1802. Yes. Yeah. Sorry? 1802, yeah. 1802, yes. So he was a child when this scene was existing. He lived in, the, his house was in the water gate when he was a child. So he would have remembered this and he would have been able to, to find out about it. Um, but he's painting it much later as an adult, obviously, but reconstructing what this area was like. You can see Smeaton's Bridge in the distance there, um, and those buildings there are the buildings you can see over there, and so on. Rather a nice view. Um, I, I, I was contacted by Dundee Museum a couple of years ago because they had this painting, and they wondered if someone could tell a bit more about it. So I was able to work out um, what it was they're looking at. And it's, it's a really nice presentation of this part of the town, um, with two of our, well, certainly one of our lost landmarks, in the form of the monk's tower, which was taken down because it was derelict in the, the obstruction um, uh, in the 19th century after this painting. Probably not after this painting was painted, but after the period that it's showing here. What we can do now is walk along the Canal Street, which is so called because it had a canal, um, which, or the, which was, it's the, the southern branch of the town's laid acting as a defensive circuit and also on a very small scale for transport, hence the man with his skiff that we saw um, waiting to carry coal up the, up the canal. We'll make our way along and at various points I will stop unpredictably and point out um, interesting things to look out for as we make our way up and round towards uh, the Carthusians and Canal Crescent. David? Hi. Spain. Lots of people ask that and we're not sure. <laughs> um, obviously it's not the river spare um, but what, why, why this area was called uh, and some spellings have it as the spy tower and the spy gardens and so on. So pass is, is really the answer. But it is, it is, I mean, it is called and, and this area, this area here is called the, 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 the spy gardens. So for some reason, all this area goes by that name. If we knew exactly what the word spay meant, 
and river names are often very old, then we might know what this meant, because all this area was waterlogged ground, um, out with the borough and prone to flooding and so on. So it may have some kind of watery meaning, perhaps in a, in, in a language earlier than Gallic. Um, who knows? It's notorious. River names are some of the oldest things you ever find, that you get pre-Indo-European river names surviving, because nobody feels like renaming them. You've got to call it something. Sometimes it has a rather obvious name in river, like other. Or the river of, in, you know, just outside Porto, in Portugal, but it just means river. It's, it's just rather obvious. But sometimes it, it, it goes back much farther to a pre county pre in the European, who knows? And, and it, river, river names are of great interest to place name specialists because they are rare survivals often of, of pre in the European languages. So let's make our way up the, the Spain Gardens. Right, um, the reason I stopped here, uh, not a lost landmark, but a, a very nice landmark, uh, St John's Episcopal, but notice, if I stand up straight, how far from straight the building is behind me. Yes, um, but that is not the cow patch. We are beyond the cow patch here. <laughs> that is just the natural deposits. All the natural around here is that kind of soft, rubbery, rubbery sand. If you ever walk on a beach where it feels like rubber, a fi very fine sandy beach with a give to it, all the natural around here is just like that. And if you have a close look at St. John's Episcopal, um, once you sort of make a conscious effort to, to stand up straight and not lean with it, you realize how much of it is on the move. Because it's a heavy building sinking into the soft sand. And as I was saying, there's, there's nothing solid under Perth until you go down 77.5 meters. So everything is a bit flexible and mobile. So it's sort of, Someone once told a story about what happens when you build a building on sand, but obviously, <laughs> but uh, and this is a nice illustration of it. <laughs> Let's carry on. Right, we are now in the Spy Gardens down here, in this area that's that was just a, a greenfield site in 1774, but develops later as Paris begins to expand, uh, and various things are happening. That I would point out, that's one of our not lost landmarks, but I don't know what it is. It's the only surviving example I know of of a factory chimney in Paris. And a very nice one. It's quite small, but in the authentic Fred Divner style. Um, <laughs> and a reminder of, of the various industries that grow up along all the branches of the lade, because you have water and somewhere to, dis to dip dispose of wastewater and so on. So some sort of feature was there. Those new flats there are on the site of what was um, a club called Electric Whispers, as some of you... I've never been in it myself. Um, <laughs> but that itself used the building that was St. Stephen's Gallic Church. Um, the remains of, until it was demolished to, to build those flats. A reminder of the large number of churches that are added to Perth in the 19th and early 20th centuries as people are moving in, including Gaelic speakers from various parts of Scotland and from Ireland as well, of course, as Perth begins to take on a bit of an industrial character and becomes a centre of employment, things like the linen industry and so on. With a reminder that Perth was, and to some extent still is, on that interface between Highland and Lowland, that was always an important part of Perth's character as an interface. For those of you who like railway history, you'll know that it was on the interface of several different railway companies. It's, it's a meeting point of LNS and LNER, and before that of Caledonian and North British. Um, it's, the, it's the meeting place, it's, it's quite close to the Highland Boundary Fault, so it's the meeting place of Highlands and Lowlands. When James I is murdered, his murderers escape into what Shirley calls the country of the wild Scots. <laughs> Meaning, as you go north of Dunkel, back in, in, into the area, as you go Athol's lands, um, you're, you're, anything can happen, you, you may never be seen again. And so that in, sense of, of Perth as an interface, and the Gallic chapel is, is part of that. It's, it's the fact that you have a, a Gallic-speaking population. Even though Perth itself historically was all the time, not being a Gallic-speaking community, because it's artificially settled by the likes of David I as a place into which you draw Lowlanders, Flemings, English, and so on. 
because it's a planted um, mercantile colony. Um, to, it's, to, to, to economic regeneration is the idea. So it wouldn't have been historically a primarily Gaelic-speaking place. And you see that in its dual name. The place is called Perth, but the community is St. John's too. So you know, Gaelic versus, or, or Pictish versus Scots. Um, that, that again expresses the interface. And here it is, St. Stephen's Chapel, Frank Lidford's chimney. Under the multi-story car park, we found in the 1980s, we found lots and lots of uh, evidence of the malting industry. Um, kilns and steeping vats and all sorts of things for converting barley into beer and possibly whiskey. Um, the, the fact that Perth becomes a great centre of the distilling industry, which again, that's a thing that slipped away from us. And we've lost most of the landmarks connected with the distilling industry. But under the car park, that might be where it all began, because that's in the backlands of South Street. And that's the way medieval boroughs work. Commercial on the, on the street frontage, industrial, agricultural, horticultural in the background behind. There's always that interface. So all sorts of interesting stuff going on under where the multi-story car park was. Um, right up to the days, of course, when um, the Dewars and Bells were both based in Perth. And I think I've told the story before that, that someone told me about how when uh, Arthur Bell and Mr. Dewar were both elders in Kinnool Church, um, and they were on their way to a Kirk session meeting and they stopped for a little drink. And um, um, Dewar asked Bell, what do you plan? I think I'll have a Dewar's. Pause. <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't even want to go into the Kirk session smelling this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and to this day, of course, a great, al almost all cultural activities in Perth float on a sea of whiskey in the form of the Gallic interest. Um, so we're, we're still, though, though we've lost the actual physical um, distilling and, 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 the, and most of the bottling and so on. We still have that connection through the Gallic Trust of the Bells family, the Dura family, and so on. So uh, let us proceed. Uh, we'll go a wee bit busy farther um, along Canal Street. We'll, what should we do? I know, yes, we will go round Canal Crescent, because I can point out a few things there, and then we will turn aside briefly to look at um, the King James VI hospital, or shall we? What shall we do? No, we won't. We'll, we'll go along our press and then I shall lead you astray. Right, so here we are in this corner here, uh, and the building, even the buildings across the way, weren't built in 1774, but we've got the corner of the canal coming here around Canal Crescent. And it's been straightened up from here on into Medlin Street, but, but, but Medlin Street doesn't exist in 1774. The reason I would gather here is to see how underpopulated this corner was in 1774 and how it's the place where sort of agricultural and industrial buildings have survived up to the present day in the form of the, of the, the former granary pub, Mucky Mulligans, etc. Up there where the, uh, the scaffolding is, that was a, a semi-industrial building that was collapsing and was taken down under the demolition order. And the reason it was collapsing is because, like all the buildings along Canal Crescent, are built on the edge of the town ditch. They're built on the edge of the town ditch, which is completely soft and wet and messy, and are sliding into the town ditch slowly. And that one, the slide wasn't so slow anymore, so they took it down. The building on the corner, there's the, 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 the green Gothic window, that's the back of the Masonic Hall, and then beyond that, the building on the corner. If you go and stand in South Street and look at that, you will see just how far off the vertical it is. And it's all the effects of the town's defensive ditch uh, and, and all the buildings slipping into it. In terms of lost monuments, um, I mean, apart from the ditch itself and lost landmarks, the telephone exchange behind us, I think, is sort of in the process of becoming a sort of monument. It must have been the cutting edge of modernity in the what, 1950s or si early 60s. Um, and you know, when you look at it, 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 you can see how they were trying very hard to capture the Festival of Britain kind of feel, that sort of thing, um, with a nod in the general direction of Basil Spence. Um, <laughs> whereas now it's looking quite sad, and of course totally redundant. I mean, there's, I think there's a, 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 you know, that size of building, the electronics now fit in a suitcase, um, and I think there is a, 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 a an electronic sort of box in the basement somewhere which performs the functions of the telephone exchange. 
but mostly it's unused, as you can see. Um, and you wonder what will become of it in the end. It's, it's of its time. That's why I think we say about things like that. When you, so you don't want what else to say about them. <laughs> um, so there we are, right on the corner of Paris, an interesting cluster of things. But what we'll do, we'll, we'll carry on this way, um, and we, we shall end up along Charterhouse Lane, called Charterhouse Lane because it's on the way to the Charterhouse, it was the Carthusian Monastery. And we'll go to the car park in Paradise Place, which is the site of the Carthusian Monastery. Um, and then I shall say a little bit more there about what might be there. We are approximately there in what Rutherford calls the Hospital Gardens. The King James VI Hospital is up there on the frontage of what was the main street out of Paris to the west and the south. The area where we're standing in the 19th century was St. Stephen's Church, which stood exactly here. And Robert was just telling me that there's a rather nice Magnus Jackson photograph of the church. And the building behind us was the church hall uh, connected with St. Stephen's Church, which has survived and is still in use, as Mike and I and others know well. Um, all this land belongs to the King James VI Hospital because it, or did, because it previously belonged to the Charterhouse, the Carthusian Friary. And their orchards, their pomarium, was up there where the pomarium flats are. These are their gardens, hence Paradise Place, um, good word medium, garden. Um, and the, the Charterhouse was built by King James I, the first of Scotland, not, not the first and, and sixth. Um, the, it was built to be the national mausoleum for the Stuart dynasty. He wanted to establish the Stuart dynasty as the, sort of the, the official, legitimate, iconic dynasty of Scotland. Perth wasn't quite the capital, but it was becoming that way. And he was going to do here on this site what the Bruce the, uh, and Canmore dynasties had done at Dunfermline. This would be the Stuarts' national mausoleum. Uh, the Charterhouse Church became his burying place and it was going to be for the whole family from then on. We don't quite know where that church was. Carthusian monasteries were a bit unusual in that most monasteries and friaries you have the church at the north and a quadrangle around it, so a cloister. And with a with um, a, uh, a dormitory on the one of the ranges of the uh, of the cloister. The Carthusians are different. They follow a pattern that's much more familiar in Ireland or in Syria, which is what I like to call a holy motel. <laughs> you have the church in the middle. You have a public courtyard to the north and to the south. You have a garden with each individual monk has his own little cell with his own little garden because they don't, until recently, they didn't live collectively, they lived individually, like monks in the Greek Orthodox tradition or in the pre-medieval um, pre Irish tradition and so on. Idiorhythmic is a long word that sounds really good to explain how they lived, but it's quite different from the normal Benedictine way of doing a monastery. And so the Holy Motel was definitely in this area to the south. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, perhaps where we are standing, or perhaps under Tezak Christian Fellowship, was the monastic church, and at the east end would be the high altar, and in front of the high altar, not only were, but are, the graves of King James I, his queen, Joan Beaufort, and Henry VIII's big sister, um, Margaret Tudor, who married James V, I think it was, or was it the fourth? Fourth, fourth. fourth. James IV, and more or less brought up Henry VIII, because she was his big sister. And those three, James, who was murdered in Perth, but always meant to be buried here, it wasn't, I mean, he's buried where he wanted to be, just sooner than he expected. <laughs> um, and Joan Beaufort, who, um, who, who briefly served as, 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 as Queen Regent after his death, um, and uh, um, Margaret Tudor, um, they are all direct ancestors, not only of our present king, but also of the Hohenzollern Kaisers of Germany, um, up to and including the last Wilhelm II and the present uh, Hohenzollern and von Preussen family who are still alive and well in Germany. So somewhere under here, and who knows where, we have tucked away the ancestors of two of the major uh, royal families of Europe. Um, 
A special link was um, uh, the Electress Sophia of Hanover, who was a descendant, a descendant of James VI, um, and was an ancestor of Frederick the Great, but was also the mother of George I of, of Great Britain. She came very close to being Queen Sophia of Great Britain because she lived well into her 80s and was a remarkable old lady, a personal friend of, um, uh, well, she was a student of um, Baruch Spinoza and a personal friend of Leibniz, uh, quite a you know, remarkably well-educated and uh, intelligent and forceful kind of lady. When Queen Anne was not quite so well, um, there was a suggestion that she, as, the, as the, the natural successor, should come to live in England, ready to take over when Queen Anne slipped away. Queen Anne thought this was a really bad idea, and so it didn't happen. And Queen Anne, in her very determined way, actually outlived uh, Sophia <laughs> by, <laughs> by a very short period of time. And so it wasn't Sophia who became Queen, but her son George, who became George I of Great Britain. But all of that, all those people are connected to the three people and are directly descended from the three people who are buried somewhere under there or under somewhere around here. One of these days, maybe we will find some way of exploring. We don't want to dig them up. I mean, they're, they're, I'm sure they're perfectly okay where they are. But we also know exactly where that was and uh, commemorate it accordingly. So we, we have our own, it's not quite a king in a car park, but uh, we have a whole collection of royal personages either in a car park or in a church garden or somewhere in here. Um, so, but oddly enough, in the place where they intended to be. It was known as the Vale of Virtue, and so it was appropriate that we leave it by going upstairs. We are here. We are still standing in what Rutherford calls the Pomarium. And we are looking down into the hospital grounds, down into the Vale of Virtue. Um, there's the hospital, the cupola up there. So that's over there. That wall there, with that interesting kink, is precisely this wall behind us. And my old friend Derek Hall, um, looking at that wall, thinks it might be quite an old wall. We may actually be looking at one of the precinct walls of the Carthusian Friary at that point there. What's rather odd is that that kink exactly matches a kink in the plan of the, of the Charter House at Mount Grace in Yorkshire. Um, which is where the monks came from to set up the Charter House here. And if they were told to build an exact copy, and they took it literally, <laughs> <laughs> that, there they would be. And at some point, I mean to sort of play with that and, and take a plan of Mount Grace and plonk it, technical term, plonk it onto a map of Perth at the right scale to see if we can get a kind of a fit to see where the friary church, where the monastic church might be and where the king and the queen uh, might be in Henry VIII's big sister um, and then we might see if there's some way of, of, of uh, uh, exploring further it's, um, but they're down there somewhere uh, that's the thing um, so there we are what we will do now is head back along Hospital Street um, I think yes along Hospital Street to that junction and I will point out in the middle of the road the circle of stainless steel plates at the junction of South Street and Hospital Street, which marks the position of the South Street port, which was one of the gates yeah. out of Paris, but also marks the position of the necessary, which, because of course the, the canal is running in a culvert underneath here, until uh, I think the beginning of the 20th century, there stood right in the middle of the road, in the best French cloche mail kind of tradition, <laughs> a cast iron public convenience, right over, um, a sort of just, just directly over the lane with a kind of a, an aperture. It was the most public of public conveniences, um, and was eventually taken down as an obstruction to traffic and possibly as offence to decency. Um, and, but there are photographs and, and, and drawings surviving on it. So, and, so that, there we are. that's another of Paris' lost landmarks, is the South Street port, or the necessary, uh, depending on whichever you, you think is more significant. Exactly, yes, yes. The necessary seems to have been, uh, in, in one way or another, a traditional way of referring to such installations. John Wesley, um, in his diaries, mentions the very sad case of a mad vicar he knew who went into his necessary house and hanged himself. Um, and 
Uh, he, John Wesley also mentions that he came to Perth and went away in despair, saying, the Lord will never do anything in a place like Perth. But that's another story. This <laughs> panel gives you an artist's impression of Mount Grace in Yorkshire, which still survives as ruins. But notice the, the wall in the distance with the distinctive kink in it, which rather nicely matches the, uh, the, the wall on, on Rutherford's map that we were just looking at. So uh, that kind of gets our bearings. This, the hospital is, is built um, fronting onto Hospital Street. This would have been the frontage of the northern court of uh, the, uh, the Charter House, the public kind of courtyard, and then the church south of that, and then the, the monks' uh, private holy motel to the south of that. <laughs> I thought I would stop here briefly to point out the circle of stainless steel plates in the middle of the road over there, which I was speaking of, where the car's just driven over now. And from here you get a nice view of the building there, uh, of how far off the vertical it is and how it's happily sliding down into the town ditch. Um, we are here to where the lane, later on the street, meets the high street. Corner. The lathe is actually passing under our feet, under this building. Um, this was the site of the, the west port of the borough, and another way out of the borough, along Long Causeway, and out to the west of Paris. Uh, St Paul's Church is, is reckoned, I think, to be the first Church of Scotland church to be built uh, in, in Paris since the Reformation, 1807. Um, and was built partly to serve the Black Watch Garrison, which was nearby on that period. So, I don't know if any of you were ever inside it. Yes. It was, yes. It was remarkable how it was so much bigger inside than yes, it is ever. Yes, but it had a galleries. gallery. It had As, the yes, gallery round. It yes. did, didn't it? And you could squeeze a lot into yes. it. Um, it only became redundant as a church, I think, in the 1980s. Something like that. Yes. Um, so, so uh, and there were many different plans what to do with this building, of which the most intriguing was to use it as a columbarium. That is to say, a repository for, crem for cremated ashes. Um, Perth at the time was promoting itself as Perth the perfect centre, and some of us thought that a suitable strap line could have been Perth, the dead centre of Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it didn't come to pass. There were various plans, but in the end they all proved impractical. And so in the end, the, the, the council decided to consolidate it simply as a shell rather than allow it to actually collapse. Um, looking behind us over there, where sadly the quality cafe is being taken down, that to many people will be another lost landmark of Paris. But there's an interesting footnote the Del, the Del Pippo family yes. who ran it also had a shoe repair shop in Skinnergate. So the Del Pippo was all perhaps Del Pippo were the last Skinners in Skinnergate, right up into the 1980s and 90s. So, that, so there was a, a, a continuing tradition of leatherworking in Skinnergate, right up into modern times, um, and, and connected with that, that well-known Parra family. So, I've told you that the lane is running under our feet, um, so we might as well go a bit farther north and see the lane once again. And I'll point out a few other things from there, and then at that point we'll probably stop on the basis that I don't want to actually cause anyone to finally smile. <laughs> <laughs> so we are here in this little patch of, of, of visible laid here with the city mills behind us and the laid running here, and somewhere out of sight a branch divides southwards and goes down Metherman Street uh, under the buildings, under St Paul's Church. Ground and so on. And the other branch, of course, goes straight down um, Mill Street, straight under that the central uh, area here. Inside Bullet, it goes under the front of Bullet, uh, the council offices, and comes out where we were earlier today. Um, so, again, not a lost landmark, but a hidden landmark. A lot of this was still open until the beginning of the 20th century. There are photographs of them paving over the area where the wheelie bins are now, I think in the 1920s, 
wanting to, to create more traffic space. So it's a landmark that's still there and now only visible there. So you have the, the lane open and rather for 1774 being gradually covered over and then covered over by Fuller's buildings, now the council offices. Head down that way. Just before you get to Fuller's, where you see that building with a kind of like a white cupola on the roof that's now blocked up, that's been various things. It's been a cafe, it was a public lavatory at one stage, um, but it's on the site of Path Steamy. If you've seen, if you've seen the well-known play, The Steamy, uh, Path Steamy was there well into the 20th century. Uh, Dennis Munro, who was director of planning, planning in Paris for a long time, told the story of how his mum, when he was a little ba a little child, used to take a pram full of, la of, of um, laundry with him sitting on top uh, along the streets to the steaming to be washed. I think to take him to be washed as well. <laughs> um, <coughs> so that was a great part of the institution. Of course, in every town, the steaming was a, a, a kind of a public thing, a, a, a quite an important community thing, hence the play on the subject. Changing the character of the town inside the lane, inside the town fences and outside. So it still defines the space, even though you can't see it. Um, and you have one of Paris' very few nods of Art Deco in the form of the Playhouse. Um, it's an interesting thing in Britain how Art Deco isn't nearly as prominent of a, 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 an art form as it is, is elsewhere. If you go to Portugal, you'll see huge amounts of Art Deco because Portugal was neutral in the Second World War and therefore wasn't bombed and didn't go through a period of economic sort of inactivity. Art Deco is all over the place and continues quite late. Whereas in Britain, we don't have a lot of it, but that's one of the few perfect examples of it. So not a lost landmark, but one that we kind of don't notice. Um, yeah. So, and over there, the, the, the North Church is a most unusual Presbyterian uh, nod at a, a Mediterranean Basilica. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, the architectural styles that get adopted. Are, are an interesting one. So that's about it from me. I think we could go back to where we started, but I think I've said everything I want to, so that you you know you can see where we started from, and we've done a kind of a loop around the uh, defensive and, and laid circuit of Paris, uh, seeing all the things that we can't see. Um, so I hope I haven't worn it, worn you out too much. <laughs>